Hey guys and welcome back to Serial Killer September on True Crime with Boingi. My name is Boingi if you're new and you're very much welcome to the channel. So today we're going to be talking about a female serial killer which is the first on my channel of course if we don't count Deborah Brown who is Alton Coleman's accomplice throughout his serial murders. But if we do count her then I guess this is the second time we're talking about a female serial killer. The woman that we're going to be talking about today seemed to have a black cloud follow her everywhere. Literally everywhere she went, people would just mysteriously and rather suddenly kick the bucket. And of course people suspected foul play, but it wasn't until her arrest that the truth finally came out. Maybe not all of it, but some of it did come to the light. Today we're going to be talking about Nanny Dawes, aka the Giggling Granny, the Giggling Nanny, the Jolly Black Widow, and slash or the Lonely Hearts Killer. So Nancy Hazel was born on the 4th of November 1905 making her a Scorpio and she was born in Blue Mountain, Alabama to Louisa and James Hazel as the first of five children, one boy and four girls. Her mother Louisa was a loving and caring woman but she was deathly afraid of her husband James who was a controlling and abusive husband and father. James would force their children to work on their family farm and would not allow them to go to school. So they'd only get to go to school once in a while, once in a blue moon, and that obviously resulted in them having a very poor academics. The journey to school was actually just as bad or almost as bad as the farm labor because they actually walked two miles to school and then two miles back home. It was dreadful. Like I said, the man wouldn't allow them to go to school. She also forbade Nancy and any of her sisters from wearing makeup or attractive clothes because she believed that that would prevent them from getting molested. But some reports do state that Nancy did get molested at some point during her life, but I only saw one report of that, so I'm not gonna... So don't quote, don't quote me on that. He also wouldn't allow any of his kids to attend social events that were going on in the town or in the village. Because her father wouldn't allow her to go to school much, Nancy ended up leaving school after completing the sixth grade. So she was about 12 years old, I presume. When she was seven, when she and her family was on a train trip to go visit some of her relatives, Nancy hit her head on the metal bar on a seat in front of her when the train suddenly stopped. And following this incident, Nancy's suffered from severe headaches, um, blackouts, and depression, all of which she blamed on this accident. During her teenage years, she developed a liking for reading her mother's romance novels and magazines, dreaming of her own romantic future, and her favorite part of the magazine was the Lonely Hearts column. So the Lonely Hearts column is a personal ad section in the magazine in which a person who seeks to find another for romantic or sexual purposes may write to with a description of themselves as well as the description of the type of person that they're looking for so it's sort of like online dating but on a magazine if you're from south africa i think it's like i think there's like dr love on one of the magazines um i'm not sure but i remember sis Dolly, and i'm pretty sure you do too <laughs> So Nancy was actually known by people close to her as Nanny and I'm going to be using Nanny and Nancy all throughout this video. So Nancy first got married when she was 16 years old to a man called Charlie Braggs although some sources refer to this man as George Fraser. I think more sources refer to him as Charlie Braggs so that's the one that I'm going to roll with. Charlie. They both worked at the Linen Thread Factory, so that's where they met. They met at work and they started dating. After about four months of dating, they asked Nancy's father for his approval, following which they got married and had children, four children together between the years 1923 and 1927, all of which were girls. Charlie was an only child to an unmarried mother who insisted on living with them, and Nancy 
hated every minute of it. Charlie's mother took up all of Charlie's attention and would also prevent Nancy from doing any of the things that she wanted to do that she liked and found entertaining. So naturally, Nancy felt that this woman was almost like the exact replica of her father. She had completely taken over her life, taken full control of her life and had made it a living hell. She was just unbearable according to Nancy and wouldn't even allow her mother to spend the night whenever she came to visit them. Needless to say, Nancy absolutely despised Charlie's mother. So to get away from the stress of being a mother to toddlers, I mean she gave birth to four children between 1923 and 1927 so all four of the children were very young kids and young kids can get annoying <laughs> so to get away from the stress of charlie's mother you know feeling trapped in her own home as well as the stress of being a mother to four girls four very young girls nancy started drinking and casually smoking but the casual smoking would soon develop to into more of an Addiction. She would also seek a shoulder to cry on from other men outside of their marriage. Charlie also disappeared for days on end. Nancy wouldn't know where the heck Charlie was. And so the couple would both just suspect each other of infidelity. I mean, it's kind of hard to trust your significant other when you don't really spend much time together. It just seems like these two were always away from each other so it was kind of hard to establish trust within the relationship because they were just each of them was just always away doing whatever they were doing you know either nancy was at the bar seeking a shoulder to cry on or charlie was away doing whatever he was doing charlie described nancy as a short-tempered cheetah and also added that he wouldn't eat or drink anything prepared by nancy whenever she was in a foul mood and that was a good call on his part honestly early in 1927 the couple lost their two middle children to suspected food poisoning the kids were absolutely fine when charlie left for work but upon his arrival he found his two daughters lying on the kitchen floor. Nancy tried to explain to him that the kids had died of food poisoning but Charlie didn't buy it for one minute. He grabbed his eldest daughter Malvina and fled from Nancy, leaving Nancy behind with their newborn baby Florine. His mother also died around this time so I'm guessing this only amplified it amped up his suspicions already so he wasn't taking any chances he grabbed his daughter and left but my thing is why did he leave, leave the newborn baby why didn't he try to save her as well charlie later returned in the summer of 1928 with melvina and another woman who was also a divorcee herself and around this time he and nanny then got a divorce nancy then grabbed her two children and moved back home with her parents and her two daughters charlie maintains that he left nancy because he was frightened of her but nancy has always been convinced that charlie's infidelity charlie's womanizing ways uh, is what led to the divorce now living in aniston with her parents nancy started writing and indulging into the lonely hearts column of the true romance magazine she saw an advert from 23 year old robert frank harrelson from jacksonville and it caught her attention they started writing to each other and sending gifts to one another robert had written her a poem and nancy in response to that poem sent him a cake they met met and married in 1929 when she was 24 and they lived together in Jacksonville with Nancy's two daughters Melvina and Florine. She later discovered that Frank was an alcoholic with a criminal record for assault and even though she was taken aback a bit by this discovery she still stayed in the relationship with him and their marriage would actually last for 16 years. Frank and her would have verbal fights every so often and he would also lay his hands on her whenever he was in a drunken state. This marriage was very toxic. The couple was always yelling. They were cursing each other out all the time and even had multiple physical fights. Considering that Mel Melvina and Florine were living under the same roof as this pair of 
toxic people one can only imagine what type of childhood they had during their 16 years of marriage Malvina and Florine grew up and got into marriages of their own in 1943 Nanny's first daughter Malvina gave birth to her first child Robert Lee Haynes and gave birth to another baby two years later but the baby died soon after she was born this pregnancy was really hard for Malvina and she just wanted her mother to be by her side as she gave birth so she asked her mother to come by and Nancy agreed. Melvina's husband, Mossy Haynes, fetched her. She gave birth to a beautiful baby girl with her mother by her side, but unfortunately the baby died just hours after she was birthed. Melvina was convinced that she saw her mother stick a head pin into her newborn baby's head and when she asked her husband and sister about it they just told her that they were told that the baby had passed on but they did notice that Nancy had a pin inside you know she was holding a pin. The doctors didn't have a clear explanation for what happened to the baby though so they just assumed that the baby died of natural causes, especially because Melvina's pregnancy, like I said, was a very difficult one. Following the baby's death, Melvina and Marcy drifted apart and during this separation, Melvina started dating a soldier. Nancy didn't approve of this soldier and she and Melvina would have arguments about this particular guy because Nancy really didn't approve of him. So in July of 1945, Melvina and Nanny got into another argument and the argument got nasty so Melvina packed up her bags and went to visit her father Charlie, leaving her two-year-old son Robert under Nancy's care. Robert would die so suddenly while left under Nancy's care on the 7th of July 1945 and even though Nancy seemed heartbroken and confused and even went to the lengths of collapsing at Robert's funeral, I'm pretty sure that Melvina could see that something was a bit sketchy about this. Two of her children died under Nancy's care. Within months, just a few months after her newborn baby's death, her two-year-old died. Both of them were under her mother's care. I am pretty sure she knew that her mother had something to do with this. The recorded cause of death was asphyxia from an unknown cause. And two months after Robert's death, Nanny begged a $500 life insurance payout, which she had taken out on Robert. That very same year, after a night of fun and heavy drinking, Frank returned home and asked Nancy to have sex with him. Nancy refused, but Frank forced himself on her. The following day, as she was working on her rose garden, she found Frank's corn whiskey jar buried in the ground. She dug it up and filled it up with red poison. That very night, Frank emptied it up and died. Nancy told the coroner that Frank was an awful alcoholic, and so the coroner ruled that Frank died a natural death that was caused by acute alcoholism. He then had a funeral and Frank was buried next to his two-year-old grandson, Robert. After Frank's death, Nancy started rising to the Long Hill Hearts column again. And through that, she met her third husband, Ali Lanning, in 1947. They met in North Carolina and actually got married after three days of meeting each other. Perhaps Nancy thought she had found another true love but Ali was quite similar to Robert. He was an alcoholic himself and also had a wandering eye. Thing for the ladies. Nancy disappeared quite a lot during this marriage. She wouldn't just disappear for like days. She would also disappear for months. Months. But when she was home she was a happy go lucky woman and she was really really liked by her neighbors. Ali knew or thought that Nancy was leaving because of his drinking and cheating and so whenever Nancy came back he would apologize and promise to never do it again and the two would play happy family. The neighbors could almost always tell when Nancy was back because they would smell apple pie in the air. The laundry was always hung outside, lace curtains on the front windows and a manicured garden. It was a lively and homely home. She was also a regular churchgoer and during this makeup period, Arlie would also accompany her 
to the Sunday services. And like I said, they play happy family. They play happy family. Everybody would see this loving and happy couple. But that wouldn't last for long because it was all a facade. People in the community knew Ali. They knew that he was an alcoholic. And they really didn't like him. They actually felt sorry for Nancy because they loved her. They adored her. She was this church going and loving and happy giggling woman and they felt sorry that she was stuck with this alcoholic womanizer of course ali would always break this promise that he had made to nancy he would go back to his alcohol go back to his girls and then nancy would pick up her stuff and leave whenever she hit the road she would claim that she was going to family and friends which was true for the most part she would sometimes go to alabama to visit her sister dovey who had cancer and sometimes she would visit ali's mother an 84 year old woman who lived in a nearby town and needed help with some household stuff. In 1950, Ali suddenly died of heart failure and at his funeral in February, people came in numbers to support Nancy, the beloved God-fearing woman. Before his death, Ali had had coffee and a bowl of prunes prepared by Nancy. He suddenly fell ill and died two days later. In his will, Ali had left his house to his sister and coincidentally, eight weeks after his death, his house burnt to the ground. The insurance company issued a check to Ali and it was sent to Nancy who was lodging with his mother at the time, with Ali's mother. Ali's mother also suddenly died in her sleep while Nancy was still living with her. After the terrible incident, Nancy cashed the check and left for North Carolina. She showed up at her sister's place and nursed her bedridden sibling. Within a few days, Dovey also suddenly died in her sleep. In October of 1952, 47-year-old Nancy got married to Richard Morton after meeting him through the Diamond Circle Club, which was, again, like a dating site. It was a club for people looking for life partners, and the subscription was $15 her annum. Nancy turned on her charm and hooked Richard, a retired businessman who was so in love with her girly giggle. He thought of her as the sweetest and most wonderful woman he had ever met, so they got married and moved to his home in Emporia, Kansas. During their first few weeks of marriage, Richard spoiled Nancy Rotten. He bought her all the finer things in life, but that would soon change. Nancy discovered that Richard was actually broke and knee deep in debt and that whenever he bought her flashy gifts he was also buying some for another woman in the same town by Christmas which was just two months into their marriage Nancy had already started writing again to the love lawn columns in the Kansas papers she made sure to always fetch the mail and would lock herself in the bathroom to read the letters which she had received from people who thought that she was a lonely widow looking for love people who didn't know that she was actually married not long after nancy's father passed away and her mother moved in with her and richard but this didn't get richard off the hook in January of 1953, Louisa moved in with Nancy and Richard and within a few days she fell ill with chronic stomach pains and died. Although Nancy would later deny having anything to do with Lowe's death, her sudden death was far too similar to the ones of her previous victims and the symptoms were all too, too, too similar. It was quite a bit suspicious. It was far too sketchy how people around Nancy were just dying. Like they were literally dropping like flies around this lady. And I don't know how nobody ever suspected her of being involved. And if they did, I don't know why they didn't go to the police. Three months after Louise's death, Richard also had similar symptoms. He suffered from very severe stomach pains and also died a few days after his symptoms, his illness. Nanny Doss's fifth and final husband was Sam Doss, a 59-year-old sturdy, solid, and God-fearing man. She took a bus to go meet Sam in Oklahoma soon after Richard's funeral and they fell in love and got married. Sam was very different from Nancy's previous husband. He was 
gentle he wasn't a violent person at all he was actually god fearing he didn't drink or smoke and would also help nancy around the house which was definitely a first he also didn't chase after women like any of nancy's previous husbands but nancy found sam boring and annoying firstly sam did not like romantic novels and magazines in fact he viewed them as evil idleness so he wouldn't allow nancy to read these novels and magazines which obviously annoyed nancy because she loved reading her no her romantic books and magazines he also didn't want her to watch tv or listen to the radio which was also another thing that really got to nancy because she loved watching everything romantic she loved she had a thing for romance he was a very conservative christian man and he wanted a wife who had views that aligned with his nancy absolutely couldn't stand this she got tired of pre-scheduling quarters she got tired of going to bed at 9 30 not watching tv not listening to the radio not reading her romantic books or her lonely hearts columns she got tired of it and got on a bus back to alabama but sam wanted his wife back so he almost immediately after nancy left he started writing letters to her just begging her to come back and telling her that he promises he'll change this he'll change that he'll try to adjust his lifestyle to fit that of nancy when nancy came back a few things changed around she was also allowed to spend some money on herself and sam also took out two life insurance policies naming her as the beneficiary one september evening after sam had had a slice of nancy's prune cake he began wrenching and grasping his stomach in violent pain he spent days in pain unable to get out of bed and even lost 16 pounds in weight finally his doctor sent him to the hospital where he spent a total of 23 days the hospital diagnosis was that he had suffered a severe infection to the digestive tract but he was nonetheless released from hospital on the 5th of October since everything was fine. He headed home to a welcoming wife who had even prepared a welcoming meal. She gave him his dinner which was pork roast and also gave him a cup of coffee to help him chuck his meal down. What he didn't know was that the coffee had been mixed with arsenic sam died before midnight literally on the same day that he got back home from the hospital when the doctor who had examined him before his release heard of his passing he was shocked he was pretty sure that this guy was absolutely fine which is why he released him so when he heard of his passing he was just he couldn't believe it so he ordered an autopsy to be conducted on sam's body in his intestines pathologists found excessive amounts of arsenic and it was actually enough arsenic to kill 10 people of course this was reported to the police and nancy was immediately arrested afterwards when she was arrested she laughed at the accusations stating that her conscience is clear she also smiled and laughed throughout the entire night but wasn't giving in she wasn't giving the police the answers that they wanted that they needed to close this case the oklahoma papers did get a hold of this story and they wrote about it and within the next couple of hours phone calls were flooding into the police station from people who knew of nancy who knew nancy and knew of her previous husbands they were just giving the police all this information that people were just dying like flies around nancy so police of course were investigating that and they did feel that they had enough evidence so they went back into the interrogation room and interrogated her again now with this information this new information that they had sometime during the next seven hours of interrogation she would giggle and admit to lying about certain things i guess her constant giggling and laughing and smiling is what gained her the name the giggling granny slash the giggling nanny she later confessed of killing sam because he was annoying her and later confessed to killing three of her other 
past husbands but wouldn't confess to any more murders even after all the other bodies had been exhumed and tested and arsenic found in the system and also determined to be the cause of death nancy still wouldn't budge she still did not confess to murdering anybody else apart from her four husbands both her mother and sister were actually also found with excessive amounts of arsenic in the system so after psychologists examined her they determined that nancy Nancy was fit to stand trial and a trial date was set but Nancy's lawyers just didn't have any advice for her I think they just knew that she was going down so because she couldn't get any better advice from her lawyers she just decided to plead guilty and on the 17th of May 1955 Nancy Dawes pled guilty so she was sentenced to life in prison she died of leukemia in 1965 at the age of 60 this lady was crazy this lady was just absolutely insane i don't understand how nobody suspected nancy for this long but i suspect it was because she was moving around so long so every time she would come to a new community where nobody knew her knew of her ways and knew of her past so she was able to just continue doing the things that she was doing charlie braggs is actually considered as the husband that got away because he's the only one of nancy's husbands who actually managed to get out of this marriage alive all of her other husbands unfortunately met a very untimely death it's it's insane like i don't understand how this lady managed to get away with this for so long for so long anyway my loves thank you so much for stopping by thank you so much for watching this video if you found it informative or if you enjoyed it if you enjoyed this little delve into the history of american serial killers then hit the like button also subscribe to my channel because there's plenty more where this came from darling there's plenty more and watch my serial killer september playlist and yeah comment down below whatever your views opinions thoughts are about this case and i'll see you guys in my next one bye